Leipzig, Germany. Located 90 miles southwest of Berlin, this quiet city on the Rhine River is called Music City by its residents, as it was home to several world-renowned composers. Long divided by religion and politics, Leipzig was subjected to Allied air raids during World War II and for years remained closed off from the rest of the world. A unified Germany has again put Leipzig on the map, and in 2006, the city was chosen as a host for Soccer's World Cup. Just one month later, it plays host to a different kind of game. The Video Game. Welcome to the Leipziger Messe Convention Center, a state-of-the-art facility that is host to this year's games convention. Hundreds of thousands of frenzied fans will enter these hallowed halls to partake in interactive demos, catch a sneak peek of the newest video game releases, and the very best in professional tournaments. Some are even camping outside so as not to miss a thing. Today, we bring you the semifinals from the Guild Wars Factions Championship, where the top four teams, two American, two Korean, hope to creep closer to the $50,000 first prize. The time is now. Guild Wars glory awaits. Now that we've met some of our teams, let's find out more about Guild Wars and how you play the game. Guild Wars at its highest competitive level is a PvP game, which is player on player, where you have a team of eight players versus another team of eight players, and then each player has eight skills. So there's a total of 64 skills on the team. It's really unique. It's, um, so it's a traditional, almost like a fantasy setting. So dragons and uh, mages and magic. There are two bases, and people fight uh, between those, and people try to kill each other with um, different kind of ways. You essentially strategize with your teammates and pick out 64 skills that you want to use, and you fight this other team uh, in, a, in a guild map. Uh, the game launches, and there's a flag stand in the center of the map. And so it's, it's kind of almost uh, like a capture the flag game going on in the center. And there's a character called a guild lord, and that is a non-player character that is the king of your castle, essentially. And then just eventually some team dies and the guild lord dies and the game is done. They're supposed to run into the center of the map at 35 minutes. Um, but it's, it's an end game to force it, so games don't go for hours and hours and hours. So gamers you know, don't die of exhaustion. Let's recap how the game is played. The main objective of Guild Wars is to kill your opponent's Guild Lord. Competitive play pits two teams of eight players. After being killed, players resurrect after two minutes, though with compromised strength due to the death penalty. A morale boost can be obtained by holding your flag stand for two minutes. If both teams are still standing at the 30 minute mark, the game moves to victory or death when both guild lords run into the center of the map for a final showdown. Let's recap the opening round of the Factions Championship. In the first matchup, the all Finnish team Irresistible Blokes took on Idiot Savants from the US. In a surprising turn of events, Idiot Savants took down the Finns in two straight games, proving to the rest of the world that this wildcard team belonged at the tournament. In the other matchup, Esoteric Warriors, a mixed European squad, faced off against Treacherous Empire from the US. At victory or death of game one, Esoteric Warriors rushed the Treacherous Empire Guild Lord, and the Americans, unable to work together, couldn't respond, in turn, losing a close one. But games two and three, Treacherous Empire came roaring back, seizing control of the flag stand and maintaining morale boosts in game two, then thwarting the infamous Blood Spike on map three by bringing the right counter spell along for the ride. That brings us to the semifinals. I'm Eamon McEnany, joined by Isaiah Cartwright. We will be describing the action from today's matches at the Guild Wars Factions Championship. Both American squads, Idiot Savants and Treacherous Empire, are moving into the final four. IQ will face the Korean powerhouse Last Pride, while TE gets the formidable War Machine, the number one seed in the tournament. Let's get down to the floor to meet the teams in the first matchup. You probably saw a few of our members with painted chests and painted faces. We're very, <laughs> very outgoing folks, and so we're very excited when we win. Maybe we'll probably win again. 
they seem pretty good at that sort of thing. Um, assuming War Machine beats TE, they're Korean, they don't sleep, it's quite an advantage. Oh, too amazing to predict anything. It's a coin toss. It's a lot of folks going in believe that both the Euro teams would clobber the American teams, and that, that did not happen. Um, so it's, we're excited. TE is a long shot to beat War Machine, but they're loose and having fun. They're a hit or miss team who were able to pull it out against esoteric warriors. There is no room for error when you take on the best team in the competition. Now, let's hear from War Machine. My name is Yiki Nam. My tag is Chang. I'm using the Gigabit computer hardware. Game 많은 사람들이 동시에 말을 하다 보면 복잡한 상황이 오고 게임 진행이 좀 어려울 때가 있습니다. War Machine is perhaps the most intense and well-trained guild at this competition. 10 hours of practice a day and hidden builds makes them very difficult to predict. They're going to capitalize on any mistake from TE. Expect War Machine to bring their A game to every match they compete in. So we are now set for the first semi-final matchup. War Machine, the heavy favorite, looking to advance against the American team, Treacherous Empire. Map one is on Burning Isle. These two teams looking to take one more step to the finals and the $50,000 grand prize. TE is the red team, War Machine the blue team, and Izzy with a take quick look at the builds, what do you notice right off the bat? Looks like War Machine's running a three Mesmer build. Mesmer is a class that has a lot of shutdown capabilities, and the particular skill that seems that they're using is Energy Surge. This has got some AoE damage and real big energy denial. Seems like it's taking its toll quickly on TE as they're pushing them right back to their base. So War Machine opens up, pushing into TE's base and remaining aggressive. TE taking heavy losses early. Uh, TE doesn't look like they're able to deal with that. This is kind of an old build that we've seen before, but no one expected it to come out in this championship. How does TE regroup? They probably thought maybe they'd be overwhelmed anyway, and now it's happening. I don't know. They're falling back. They're trying to deal, but uh, War Machine's quickly cleaning up those NPCs. It looks like TE's running a split build, which is a real bad choice for them on this map. This is the Game 1 matchup from the semifinals of the Guild Wars Factions Tournament in Leipzig, Germany. War Machine, the heavy favorite here against TE, and showing why early. So it looks like War Machine's got this game under control. They pushed TE back into the base, but TE's able to sneak one player out. Trex, Wendy's out here killing these Flame Sentinels. This will really open it up for them to be able to get their split going. Izzy, what exactly do you try to accomplish with the split? Well, you need to get your, uh, your your split characters, Sheep and Bob, into the back of the base and start whittling on those NPCs so that when VOD comes around, you have a nice NPC advantage. VOD occurs after 30 minutes of play, victory or death. That is the end game situation in Guild Wars. Doesn't look like War Machine's able to really push it in. They've had to fall back a little bit here as uh, TE's slowly gotten that split going and starting to whittle on their NPCs. T getting back in it after being dominated early by War Machine. Yeah, those heavy DP losses are going to really cost them this game. I don't know how well they're going to be able to pull it out. And War Machine's continuing to get morale boosts. Those morale boosts will be key as they acquire them, especially if we make it to victory or death. War Machine's able to still turn and get a spike off and kill players at win. We mic'd up some of our competitors. Let's hear what Paladin has to say as we listen in. Never mind. Just go, just go, Bob. Just go. Go to their base. You and Trex take out all their NPCs. Turtle up in the bodyguards. They haven't said anything back yet. Get back inside. Both bodyguards and one archer. They're too close. Trex, get back. Trex! Just get out. It's too late. Get out. Get out. War Machine is able to repel them out of their base because that DP is really stacked up on them. They're really easy to kill. Izzy, explain the death penalty and the role it plays in a long match. 
death penalty is what accumulates every time you die. The more of it you get, the easier you are to kill. So it's really dangerous to have a, a lot of death penalty as you move in towards the end game. And the character Sheep is Why suffering many out? DPs. They're going to be looking. T's going to need to get a morale boost to help him out. Yeah, he's 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 been hurting a lot this game. He's had a couple deaths, and the split's not doing good for him. If he's not careful, he's going to get DP'd out here. So WM continuing to keep TE on its heels as War Machine is controlling this match. Looks like Sheep went down again as War Machine's clearing the whole team in the middle here. He's got to be careful. I don't think he's going to resurrect on this one. Oh yeah, definitely looks like Sheep did not resurrect on this one. That's going to give War Machine a huge advantage as TE's now having to fight seven on eight and they're not going to come back unless they get a morale boost. War Machine once again showing all that practice, all that work starting to pay off. Well, it's been paying off pretty much right from the get-go in this game. Yeah, TE was not expecting this level of build, and their split strategy is just not working out for them. They might have done better if they didn't take so many key losses in the beginning, but that's really hurting them. So will TE be able to rally and force this match to VOD? What kind of shape do you see War Machine in right now? Are they uh, firmly in control of this one? Well, uh, they've... they've Lost a couple NPCs due to the split, but they've got that huge morale advantage. And so when VOD comes around and you all get a little weaker and things get a little more dangerous, they're going to be able to really drop to me. Looks like they're already going. They're going to try to finish it right now. They're on the Guild Lord, and uh, TE's dead. Let's see if they can resurrect in time to save him. The clock is ticking on TE. Looks like we got a few more seconds until resurrection, and they've gotten their monks up with some with some quick reses, and this is going to keep them alive. War Machine's just pounding away at that guild board, trying to get them down. How important are the monks? What, why are they so important for uh, T? Well, the monks are what you use to keep your team alive, and so you really need them to keep that guild lord going. It looks like that res came just in time, and they were able to repel War Machine for just a few more moments, but War Machine's quickly back at it and putting the pressure on TE. Yeah, War Machine's got a huge NPC advantage in the middle, and with a very aggressive build, TE down on morale. This shouldn't be much of a fight here in the middle. They're spreading all over the place. They don't know what to do. It's chaos. Come on. I'm, I'm so on the TE top. has picked up a Who's morale boost, but is it too little, too late? As War Machine has a huge morale boost advantage, a huge NPC advantage. Izzy, what can TE do? Well, they had Sheep in there for a few more seconds, but he went right on down. And it's already a little bit late for them as their guild lords advanced up, so they couldn't get a gank in. That was probably one of their last ditch efforts, but they weren't able to even attempt it. War Machine's been on top of these guys the whole game. All of that practice for War Machine is continuing to pay off. They are dominating TE. TE continuing to pay a price for those early deaths. Looks like that guild lord's going down fast. So here comes War Machine looking to take advantage and grabbing game one. They have dominated it from the get-go. There goes the Guild Lord down, and War Machine takes game one. Koreans overwhelmed TE split build early on, and the Americans just could not recover in time. <laughs> War Machine chose the Fire Island map. If you remember one of the battles Treacherous Empire played against Esoteric Warriors, they won on the Fire Island map. Once again, Trex from Treacherous Empire, the Ranger, went out by himself, cleared the path, and managed to kill off one or two of the bodyguards and archers. However, the cost was too high. For the next 15 minutes of the battle, War Machine basically kept them pinned inside their headquarters and kept sneaking in and finally managed to kill off some of the bodyguards and archers through persistent movement. War Machine managed to just pile up kill upon kill upon kill, and at 38 minutes they completely killed Treacherous Empire's team and took out their Guild Lord for the first victory. When we come back, it's a must win for Treacherous Empire as they take on War Machine in game two of the semifinals at the Guild Wars Factions Championship.
Welcome back to Leipzig, Germany and the Games Convention. Thousands of fans are still streaming in, hoping to get a closer look at the Guild Wars Factions Championship. Game two between Treacherous Empire and War Machine is coming up. Let's recap what we saw on the first map. War Machine, a very strong team, was mauling Treacherous Empire and ended up killing one of the characters completely out of the game at about 15 minutes. The Korean guilds are very strong at working together and they have some of the best healing monks in the world. We kind of have a, a, a rivalry with TE, so we'd like to see War Machine win. Treacherous Empire did manage to pull off one or two minor kills, but there still was such a huge morale advantage. It looks like TE has decided to stick with the same map, Burning Isle. They either have something up their sleeve or they're wanting for punishment. Hey, profane over here, party. They should probably bring a profane. Come on, I know you like it, but it rapes, dude. Not bring Some last minute confusion there on what skills to bring. They're deciding between Wella Profane and Heal Party. While Wella Profane can punch through the enemy's defenses, Heal Party will keep you guys alive. We'll find out quickly if that decision pays off as we begin game two. Game two is underway. WM in the red, TE in the blue. And TE kept the same map, Izzy, but do you see any changes being made? Yeah, it looks like TE's running a bunny thumper build. This is where they run ranger warriors and pets, and they're going to try to overload War Machine really early on. What does bunny thumper bring to the game for TE? So uh, bunny thumpers give them a lot of extremely aggressive play early on with a lot of overwhelming tactics, but it looks like War Machine was well prepared for this map and has brought out a really crazy split early on and is already working on their bodyguards. What is so crazy about the split that WM's using? Well, normally it takes a few minutes to get back into the area on the fire map, but War Machine devised a little strategy and they got past those flame sentinels extremely quickly without even killing them. They got back there, they were able to kill a bodyguard, and then they got resurrected at their base. Looks like TE aggressively pushed into War Machine has already put them back in their base around the two minute mark. So War Machine back to its base quickly in this game. We'll win by War Machine, we'll put the team in the semifinals. TE looking to force a game three. Looks like TE's having an extremely hard time pushing into War Machine's base. I bet they were wishing they brought that well up for fame now. Now what would that have done for them at this point? Well you see they're really having a hard time pushing into War Machine's defenses. Those pets that they bring along with the Bunny Thumper builds, they die extremely easily. But they need some way to utilize those pet deaths to fuel their build. And one of those good ways is Wella Profane, which will strip all the defenses of the enemy. As we heard the team discuss between game one and two, the thought to bring Wella Profane to this game was certainly discussed. They decided not to do it. It looks like uh, hindsight being 2020, they'd love to get in a time machine and change that decision right now. War Machine's definitely taking advantage of their misfortune and is trying to get the Flame Sentinels down so that their split can get to work. War Machine's number two player, Crazy Queen, coming up big for War Machine. Yeah, I just took out both those Flame Sentinels, which is extremely hard to do with her build. And uh, this is forcing TE to have to send some characters back, which is not very good when you're running Bunny Thumpers. So War Machine's really punishing TE for not having that Well of Profane. And they're pushing them back to the flag stand. They've been junking around all game after they killed those Flame Sentinels. And I'm really starting to get some momentum back up here as VOD is just now happening. We are at VOD, and despite being pinned in its base almost the entire game, WM has picked up some valuable NPCs. Yeah, they were able to kill a bunch of TE's NPCs, giving them a strong advantage. They didn't think a team could get pinned for 30 minutes and then come out ahead. So we are just into VOD here. War Machine looking to seal the deal and eliminate TE. TE looking to stay alive in the tournament. Yeah, TE's having a real hard time hitting through all these NPCs. They didn't really get any kills when they had War Machine pinned in their base, and they're having a real hard time on this bridge. All right, Blue picks up a morale boost as TE's trying to stay alive. The Bunny Thumper, though, is not having its day, as you see. Just hammering away there. Yeah, it looks like uh, the bunny thumpers are going down quick and the offense is crumbling as they're having to try to deal with both the split and the NPCs in the middle. Things are not going TE's way here in a game they must have to force a game three. War Machine looking to close it out and they are in control of this one. Yeah, TE dominating the whole beginning of this game. We're unable to seal the deal due to a small skill mishap. War Machine continuing its killing spree and it is pushing TE, looking to push TE out to the middle. 
War Machine now pushing back has gotten some good kills on TE. This might be a good time for them to get a nice needed morale boost. Now we are just over, we're almost at four minutes in the VOD. War Machine continues to control the action and have things go their way. Yeah, TE making mistake after mistake here at VOD. Not only did they not have the well of profane needed to push into War Machine's base, but they're just getting outclassed in the middle here. Well, when one team practices for 10 plus hours and the other team sort of makes a strategical error before it starts, uh, that's setting the stage for a, a mismatch. Yeah, War Machine will definitely capitalize on any and every little mistake that you make. TE's gonna have to make a real strong push here at the end of the game to even have a chance to survive. Let's listen in to Paladin from TE. Push hard, push hard, spread that defense. This is game, let's go. Push him across, push him across. Stop that heal party. Stop that heal party. Push into him, push into him. They still have a bodyguard. Get the back. All right, get ready to future. Spread that defense. Watch Paladin, knock down. TE's gonna have a really hard time in here even though the Bunny Thumper build is extremely aggressive. That large NPC advantage is just giving War Machine all the offense they need. So what we have here is TE's Guild Lord has moved on up and TE's now pushing into him. And we're having the final standoff between these two teams. Here it comes down to this between War Machine and TE. Look at several players there in the middle going at it. Looks like uh, War Machine's cleaning up TE's monks, trying to get a final push for that Guild Lord as soon as it can. They're going after the monks to eliminate their healing powers to make the Guild Lord that much easier to kill. And in doing so, capturing the game and moving on. Yeah, at this stage in the game, your monks only have to be down for four or five seconds for them to just drop that Guild Lord. So the monks are going down, and War Machine is moving in on the cusp of capturing this game. You look at the energy going down from the Guild Lord. The Guild Lord is fading. They continue to help the Guild Lord, and there is the Guild Lord going down, and it's over. War Machine has captured game two. They have done away with TE. War Machine is moving on to the final. Treacherous Empire, since they were already down one, tried to run a Bunny Thumper build. Bunny Thumper means you're running a lot of rangers that have pets, but there's also a spell called Death Nova that you would normally want to use, that when you send your pet in, you make your pet explode like a bomb and do damage all around them. They didn't take that with them. Unfortunately, War Machine was able to keep up the pressure and keep it even, and then eventually they were able to just press and press and press and kill the Guild Lord at about 38 minutes. 25분 이후에 화염 병사가 죽고 나서 작업을 할수 있어 가지고 우리가 나눠 가지고 공격을 하고 막루 쪽에서 나눠진 상태에서 더 유리한 경기를 해서 이길 수 있었던 것 같습니다. War Machine moves on to the finals with a $50,000 for first place and $25,000 for second. $50,000 is the prize. No chump change for a video game in its first year of competition. As games enter the mainstream of eSports, so do the gamers. And since we've always heard about how different video game players are, let's hear about the things that they all have in common. Well, you have the typical gamers that uh, are casual, you know, play a few times a week, go out with their friends. And then you have the hardcore gamers that train for 40 hours a week. It's definitely more of a leisure thing for me. Get my aggression out instead of punching someone. <laughs> we all knew each other during the alpha when the game was going through beta testing. Just sort of met by uh, hanging out on the web forums and bonded together uh, over the internet, surprisingly, um, which is kind of the first time where I met a bunch of guys over the internet. Yeah, that's been a st uh, stereotype for all the gamers as nerds for a long time in Finland, too. I think people don't really think about the whole geek thing. Um, well, but too busy playing, hence uh, why people think it. And there's all, also little communities inside games. People look down on other people inside the game. There's like tears of geekiness. You've always got someone who you consider more geeky to look down on. It makes you feel better about yourself. All my friends are normal guys, play sports and that kind of stuff, love to play video games. And if you just meet any of the European guilds, they come to Germany, they go to Taipei. First thing they do, they are out in the bars, meeting girls and drinking. So they're just normal people that, you know, one of their hobbies just happens to be video games. I feel if you have a fit body and, you know, you're you condition daily, I think it really does help your reaction time. I'll wake up uh, 
usually early in the morning. I'll go for a two mile run and then just basic calisthenics. Maybe go to the gym occasionally. Not, not nothing too heavy. I am I am a nerd, so I you know I can't bodybuild or anything. I played football for eight years. I uh, was in free fighting and kickboxing for two years. Suyong uh, and tennis. Keeping it good. Doing it after the game. 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 Apparently, you know, it's like sports, you reach that peak, you know, in your 20s and then you, know, you got to stop because you get arthritis and bad knees and I don't know if you need knees for gaming, but, you know. The stigma of gamers being geeks probably pretty much the same in the States and Europe. Um, I suppose we could pretend to care, but we'd rather just have beer, to be honest. It's one of the main reasons for being here. They give us money, it goes to drink. We probably wouldn't go into something like this drunk. I think the Finns might have, but they're Finns. They go into everything drunk. In this tournament, um, we, me and Uhu were drinking vodka to prepare ourselves. We like, gathered all the head guys in a room and drank some Finnish vodka and thought about the tactics. I went to a club in the morning. I ate food together, I ate dancing together. But I liked the best There's some theory that beer makes you better at games and hand-eye coordination, that sort of thing. So we're going to test it. We all have a different number of beers, like one to eight. Whoever died the most, obviously this was the worst amount of beers. Whoever died the least, was the best. So therefore, we should carry on drinking that amount. You have to have some limits because you are playing if you're playing from 50,000 euros, you don't want to spoil it by getting drunk. When we come back, we'll bring you the other semi-final game between Last Pride of Korea and Idiot Savants of the United States from the Guild Wars Factions Championship. We are back at the Leipziger Messe Convention Hall and the Games Convention. The semifinals of the Guild Wars Factions Championship is about to get underway. Let's meet the final two teams. You know, we had a bunch of people in Brazil, we had people in California, we had people in Canada, uh, New Jersey, and from the Midwest. Uh, the first time we actually got all together was when we got to go to Taipei for the first Guild Wars uh, World Championship. And so that was uh, really a blast. And most of us are back here for Germany. As far as superstitions go, we used to always sort of run around and then all meet up in game in a little ball right before the match, just so it's kind of like a little signal, like I'm here, I'm here. We would do that every, every season uh, during the playoff matches and we kept losing, so we, we stopped doing that. Here in Leipzig, because we're also jet lagged, everyone's been drinking Red Bull, <laughs> but that's, that's not normal. Well, we got to win our matches against Evil, and they're the current world champions. They won in Taipei, and they are consistently number one uh, every season, so they're really good, and it's going to be a tough match, but we'll see what we can do. We'll be a little disappointed if we don't beat Evil, but 
it'd, it'd definitely be an upset, I think, if we, if we did, so. IQ is the wild card seed. They have turned heads at this tournament, breaking out interesting strategies and doing whatever it takes to win. They took down irresistible blokes in round one with some strong tactics that left their opponents puzzled and equally impressed. Now let's hear from Last Pride. Last Pride is one of the strongest teams in the game. Their key to winning lies in their strategy, both great flag control and their ability to dictate movement on the battlefield. They have dominated IQ in the past and are looking to continue that trend. It's Last Pride's last shot with this current team. And they take on the upstart idiot savants from the U.S., a team that won't go down easy. Map one is on Isle of the Dead. Idiot Savant is in the red. Last Pride, also known as Evil, is the blue team. And Izzy, what can you tell us about the Isle of the Dead? Well, uh, the Isle of Dead is a uh, one of the guild halls that Evil has chosen here. And it looks like IQ has gone with a Ranger Spike team, which is unfortunate on this guild map because it's really hard to get those arrows to land through all the stuff in your way. Izzy, we know about Last Pride's track record, but what can you tell us about their style? Well, they really like to uh, split on their enemy. Um, Bloodlight and Last of Master are usually the guys leading the split, and they always get into the base and cause tons of confusion. IQ is going to have to really be paying attention to that. And as for IQ, what are they going to have to do to be able to pull off this upset? They're going to have to be all over Bloodlight and Last of Master and make sure they cannot get into that base and clear those NPCs out. If they shut them down, they can shut that team down. So the match is just underway. Izzy, do you think IQ is up against it, though, with their build against this map selection? Yeah, it looks like Evil's just completely dominating IQ here. IQ's gotten a couple spikes early on, but Evil's just gotten their split going real fast and is already starting to trash all of IQ's defenses. Now IQ trying to regain its footing somehow, but it looks like those splits are distracting them. As Evil normally does, they've completely gained control over the flag this entire game and are making it really hard for IQ to even stay in it. We are over five and a half minutes played in this game and there is a morale boost for Last Pride. Yeah, Evil's gotten right on in there and controlled that flag from the beginning. Their split gets back there and cleans up those NPCs. Looks like IQ's trying to push back for a flag, but just falling short. Yep, just not getting to it in time for IQ as they continue sort of to be behind the eight ball by Evil here in this one. IQ's trying to get a spike up, but Evil's being really good at disrupting their ability to get their spike to land, and their monks are e of Evil's are probably some of the best in the game. Disruption is where you disrupt the enemy's spike and you reduce their damage by stopping one of their players from doing what he needs to do. So Evil continuing to control this one early on. Looks like uh, Evil's pushing IQ back into their base and forcing them to turtle with the few NPCs that they have. Evil in control of this game as we've just passed the 10 minute mark. They pick up another morale boost as they continue to grab control. IQ's having a real hard time here. They haven't even gotten much out of their base anymore since Evil has gained control of that flag stand and has just been bullying them around this whole game. So Evil now controls the movement, they control the flag stand, they've had the majority of the morale boost. This is all Evil right now. Yeah, all, all Evil's really got to do here is get some choice kills and swing around and try to finish that Guild Lord off early. But they've set themselves up extremely well for VOD, so so far, Evil's really doing good here. IQ's gonna have to pull something out. IQ starting to answer here at the just over 13 and a half minutes. Starting to 
Look, maybe look for their spikes here, Izzy. Yeah, it looks like they uh, were trying to get a couple there. But, uh, oh, they got one of the Evil's monks down, which is pretty impressive at this point. Let's listen in to Rain from IQ. Hit this guy in four, three, two. Lost target. Try it again. Chuck, can you work a flag out? Yeah, we're Yeah, I mean, you get in the base and uh, call a spike on him. That's the best you can do. You know, Izzy, you mentioned they're going to have a huge advantage in DOD. The way it looks now, IQ would be lucky to get there. Yeah, they're having a hard time even staying it up. They really need that morale boost, and they just can't get that flag to the stand. Evil continuing to route IQ here in the game one of this semifinal matchup. Yeah, this looks like it's all evil all the way. Right now, they're just getting kill after kill and driving IQ sent running to their defenses. So evil continuing to push, continuing to stay on the assault. Evil's looking to make quick work of this one. Kill after kill, Evil's pushing them back into their base. They're without monks here, and they're just going right to the base. Evil continuing to play cleanup, and they're going after a poorly defended guild lord. Yeah, it looks like without any monks and the res coming a little ways away, they could put this one down early. That's the game plan, it appears, as they pick up another morale boost just after the, or just at the 16-minute mark. Evil trying to take care of this one, let alone before victory or death. They're looking to take care of this one before 20 minutes. Yeah, it looks like one monk's already DP'd out on IQ's team is not coming back. It's going to make short work of that guild lord as soon as they can. So Evil continuing to play cleanup. They're making their move right there on a poorly defended guild mode. Yeah, with all the monks down, both uh, Bloodlight and Last to Master, the assassins of this game, have really been able to tear up the defenses. That guild lord's going down quick. He's less than half-life. So here it is, the finishing touches on a game one victory for Evil as they continue to hammer away at the weakened guild lord. And there it is, the guild lord goes down. Evil, in dominant fashion, takes game one. IQ now has to recover quickly to stay in the tournament. Yeah, I don't know if we can match their mobility on that map. Uh, there's two, yeah, because there's two ways out of the base, so it's hard to Plus catch. the teleport. In the first match, Gideon Savant played a Ranger spike build with four different Rangers where they would all target call and double arrows and crippling shots and all the rest to try and take them out. The last Pride played a double assassin gank build with two Mesmers, which means basically they had two assassins. And assassins from Guild Wars factions can teleport in and teleport art and can take out NPCs and if you're not careful, can jump in and kill your characters when you're not prepared. Soul Wedding and Anyang and the others are some of the best in the world at playing these sorts of characters. They've got a good spike though. They, even if they just run those double assassins, they can be tough. Stay alive. But I think we can do it. We couldn't get off on that slow of a start and expect to win. Last Pride is looking loose after their one-sided victory in Game 1. IQ's got to change it up or they're going home. It's Game 2 on Isle of Jade. Game 2, IQ in blue, Evil in red, and Izzy as we take a look at the map and the builds, what do you see? Well, we're uh, running here, it looks like IQ's ran the same build that they ran against IB second game, and Evil's running the same assassin split build that's been working for him so far. If it ain't broke, why fix it, right? Because that was certainly an impressive victory in game one for Evil. Yeah, it seems to be doing well for him here as they're already in their base, bouncing around, causing havoc. So Evil quickly taking the play to IQ in this one, game two. Yeah, as you can see here, Evil's bouncing around in their split and getting some kills on IQ early on. So IQ suffering kills early and now starting to retreat, it seems, back into its base. Yeah, this is almost looking like the games we've seen with Evil in the past. It's just quick domination and quick killing of those NPCs early on. That's their signature calling card, and they'd love to have another early win to avoid VOD and just take care of this one and move one step closer to the $50,000 grand prize. Looks like IQ's defensive nature has been paying off a little bit for them as they've been able to hold off evil when they get a straight-up fight. So only really when they get split up do they have the problems. So IQ continuing to force evil out, doing a good job, as you mentioned, with their defense. Looks like Evil is causing IQ to retreat back into their base, and it looks like 
IQ is now having to kind of turtle up by their base as Evil's pretty much dominated them around the main field. Evil and Relentless kind of go hand in hand in this competition. That they do. IQ sitting back in its base and just almost like they're parking themselves there. They're just kind of getting comfortable and trying to push Evil out. So we advance past the 20 minute mark. We are getting to VOD, but this one continues, much like game one, to be all about Evil carrying the play. And look at this, all of a sudden IQ's breaking into a little dancing routine. All the characters in Guild Wars can dance, but uh, as you can see, the, the Rangers are really getting down here in the middle of IQ's base. Are the Rangers the best dancers? Uh, it's debatable. And here we are at VOD. Victory or death, the end game. Who's in better shape right now as we approach this? Well, Evil's definitely uh, controlled a lot of this game. They've gotten a lot of NPCs down. All right, it looks like IQ is pushed for a gank into the back of Evil's base. A similar strategy they used in Game 2 versus IB. That's how they got here, but now they're facing a much tougher opponent, so it should be interesting to see if it is effective again as they go after the Guild Lord. Definitely looks like Evil's having a hard time keeping that Guild Lord alive, but luckily their offense is coming in and starting to whittle down IQ. This is a battle here in VOD between IQ and Evil. IQ needing a win here to force a Game 3. It's definitely looking like Evil's got the upper hand. They're able to keep their Guild Lord going and are starting to get some kills on IQ. With IQ having no NPC advantage at this point, it's not looking good for them. They just got a nice kill on Evil, but it wasn't enough. Most of IQ's team is down, forcing them to retreat as fast as they can. Let's listen in to Rain from IQ. All right, guys, pull out. Pull out so we can get the rest of the 34 and have a full team. We've successfully waited now until the 35 minute mark, pretty much, so we can escort our Lord out. I don't know how many NPCs they have left. All right, guys, good, good luck. See you on the other side. The Guild Lords are coming down, and it's going to be a final showdown right in the middle. So now IQ looking to level the playing field. Looks like we got a, the meteor shower going on here, where uh, IQ has rounded up all of Evil's NPCs and is meteor showering them all to death. A rare skill seen in this game. What does the meteor shower do? Well, we saw this in game two versus IB. It does a lot of AOE damage and kills those archers extremely fast. So IQ trying to use the meteor shower to its advantage to capture game two against Evil and force the game three. Yeah, it looks like they're uh, doing a really good job of killing all of Evil's NPCs and destroying their entire NPC advantage here at the end. NPCs, the non-playing characters that are so important in VOD. Yeah, it looks like IQ has gotten all of those NPCs down and is now starting to pressure that kill boat a little bit. So now IQ leveling the playing field and trying to pick up a win here as they go after the Guild Lord. Yeah, it looks like they've gotten all the NPCs down and are now putting all of their pressure right on that Guild Lord. And now, Evil not exactly prepared to heal the Guild Lord as you see the Guild Lord's energy fading. Yeah, the Guild Lord's health is going down quickly, and those monks, they don't have the energy to keep this up. I think IQ's discovered a weakness in Evil. So IQ now continuing to pepper and pound the Guild Lord as you see the Guild Lord going down. The Guild Lord trying to stay in it, but IQ not letting up at all. There goes the Guild Lord down. He tries to get back up. He continues to get pounded, and it doesn't look like he's getting up from that one. An amazing, stunning turn of events as IQ comes up with the victory on Evil. Wow, we just saw another exciting match. Everybody thought the Last Pride had this match. The first three minutes, Last Pride took out three of Idiot Savant's players using, again, their double assassin gank build. Idiot Savant's built a more balanced build after trying the tricky ranger spike the first time. And 10 minutes in, all the Idiot Savants could do was pull back and turtle, which means they basically hide amongst their NPCs to stay protected. Idiot Savants then went for it, where they charged all the remaining warriors against the Guild Lord of Last Pride, and their other characters did barely lasted long enough to hold Last Pride off. Nobody saw it coming. Even Idiot Savants is surprised by this one. When we come back, we will see the third and decisive match between Last Pride and Idiot Savants at the Guild Wars Factions Championship in Leipzig, Germany.
Welcome back to Leipzig, Germany and the Guild Wars Factions Championship. If you're just joining us, you're in for an exciting Game 3 between two top guilds. From South Korea and reigning world champion, it's the last pride. Their opponent from the U.S. is the upstart wildcard guild, Idiot Savants. Let's get down to the floor as the match is about to start. The last pride was clearly winning. They had the morale advantage. They had all the towers captured. They kept doing splits and pulling people out of position. In victory or death, Idiot Savants was able to concentrate firepower and take out a couple of the NPCs in the mixed melee. It still looked like they were going to lose, and they went for it. We're basically going to try and go with what works. We're going to try and play real defensive and try and hold out longer so we have time to strategize. This is Eamon McEnany along with Isaiah Cartwright, and because today's matches have run so long, the third game is taking place behind closed doors. Though the crowd won't be there to cheer them on, this match should provide plenty of drama. And what appeared to be a foregone conclusion, now suddenly has the Americans with a chance to pull off a stunning upset. The winner goes on to the finals to face War Machine. Map three is on Isle of the Dead. So it comes down to this, game three, evil in the blue, IQ the red, and Izzy, as we take a quick look at the builds, evil not used to bouncing back from the loss, did they make any adjustments? No, it looks like evil has made no adjustments. Very little has gone right back into the game with what they had before, and IQ the same. Yeah. Now, well, that's odd. Looks like IQ has just stepped out of the base, took one look around, and went right back in. Izzy, you want to take a guess uh, what's behind that weird strategy? I don't know, maybe IQ's trying to fall back to their base and uh, force Evil to come to them. Well, that certainly probably has Evil thinking about what's going on right now. So IQ going off of an interesting tactic right away. And Izzy, one thing I want to ask you about, because we mentioned it before this game got underway, there is no crowd left in Leipzig. Will that change sort of the intensity or the style of play from the players? And definitely, both teams seem to be Have way to be more here. relaxed without the crowd in their face, screaming at them for every mistake they do. So we've just passed the three and a half minute mark of this decisive game three between Evil and IQ. IQ, really a Cinderella story here going up against the heavily favored Evil team. Yeah, it's it's amazing that they've come this far. IQ's a strong team, but to beat Evil, that's, that's almost unheard of. So it looks like we got a blue morale boost being picked up there. As some of the action is starting to pick up, but again, they seem content and relaxed to sort of see how this one plays out. Yeah, it looks like IQ's just kind of teasing them a little bit outside their base, letting Evil get all the morale boost. I IQ's not even running flags. Evil looks confused, trying to figure out what to do. Half their character's set up to, you know, defeat them on mobility, but they're not even moving. How, how do you defeat someone with mobility when they're not even moving? Hey, Evil's, Evil's having a really hard time. They're getting in there and running into traps. They're running into Augie, beating on him with a hammer. The Guild Lord shooting him with a bow. They, they don't They don't have a, a very good chance to push into that base, and they're having to go in and then retreat and just constantly try to push in there, but they're not making any ground. Augie, the linebacker, describe just how effective he's been here at Leipzig as we go to, right now to victory or death. Well, it seems like he's been getting on all of the target callers of all the teams and really suppressing every team's ability to, you know, continue with their strategy. Here comes IQ out of its base, flanked by its NPCs, as we are in VOD. Yeah, for the first time after Correct. 30 minutes of sitting around, IQ stepping out of their base, walking out with their NPCs, and looks like they're going to maybe be, you know, aggressive here. Well, they'll certainly be fresh, that's for sure, because they didn't do much for 30 minutes. Yeah, after that nice break, they're pushing out with their NPCs. It looks like they're going to try to have a fight with Evil right here in the middle. So here it goes, the action picking up, victory or death IQ now after sitting on its hands, starting to be aggressive and take it to Evil. Yeah, we're seeing some of IQ's signature meteor shower move on Evil's NPCs. Starting to kill some NPCs, but Evil's responding well. They're starting to clean up a lot of IQ's NPCs and really trying to uh, get some kills while they're out of their base for once. So it appears that the stall technique once again has accomplished the goal for IQ. Yeah, they got a level playing field here in the middle, which is not looking good for Evil as Evil's entire build is set up to run around the map and gain this huge NPC advantage. And now it looks that they don't have any. It doesn't get any better than this. Victory or death in a decisive game three, a trip to the finals, and a chance at $50,000 on the line. 
So the interesting thing here is, even though IQ's out of their base, they're still starting to take some losses. Uh, they're gonna, they're gonna have to start running flags here soon. So let's see if IQ can do that as they try to shock the world by coming up with this upset over Evil. So it is now a straight up fight between both teams, Evil and IQ in victory or death. Yeah, it looks like IQ finishing off the last of Evil's NPCs, taking a couple key losses here and there. They're really struggling for morale. Looks like for the first time this game, they're starting to bring a flag on in. Izzy, how odd is it to run your first flag this late in the game? It's, it's completely unheard of. Normally you've run flags this entire game, but it looks like IQ is just playing this from the beginning. So IQ captures a flag at 35.50. In two minutes, they will have a chance for a morale boost, which would be huge in victory or death. We will keep our eye on that. IQ continuing to pressure that guild lord, but taking a couple key losses, that morale boost might come in just at the nick of time. So the monks are withering, and IQ has set themselves up for a morale boost in 10 seconds, which would be huge here. Yeah, IQ could really use that morale boost as they've lost their monks a couple times here and wasted some sit. They'll get it in two, one, and there it is, the morale boost at 37.50. Should be interesting to see if IQ can take advantage as they now head towards the Guild Lord once again. Yeah, that morale boost was huge for IQ. They can really keep up the pressure on that Guild Lord now that they can bring those monks back. Not everything all going IQ's way, though. They are taking losses from Evil's defense, but at the same point, they're starting to deplete the energy pool of Evil's monks, which is huge when you go after the Guild Lord. Yeah, both sides have been trading kills back and forth and getting those Guild Lords down to half and then healing them right back up. It's a close game. So the monks play such a crucial role in victory or death. We have just hit the 40-minute mark in a match that continues to last. All right, who will blink first? A trip to the finals and a chance at $50,000 on the line as Evil gets a morale boost right there. Man, that was unexpected. IQ just getting a morale boost. Evil was able to squeak in there and get the flag right afterwards. This might, this might do it for him. Let's hear what Rain has to say as we listen in. They have a flag. It's gonna have to be everything on the Lord at this point. I don't think we have any more rest. They're out of energy. Everything on the Lord. Smite the Lord, everything. Looks like IQ's making a final push without any monks on that Guild Lord. And it's going down. He's a, a moment from death, and that Guild Lord is just on, barely everything. hanging on. What is keeping that Guild Lord up? He is going down. IQ looking to put the finishing touches on what would be a remarkable upset, and there it is. IQ hammering the Guild Lord, and it's over. A stunning upset knocks off the heavily favored Evil Squad. That was an incredible finish, and Evil is stunned in disbelief. Uh, 저희는 그렇지 않아 그렇지 못했고 그냥 같이 걸어갔 그냥 걸어가다가 잔디밭에 누워 있었는데 아 그때 그 동안 서로 멤버들과 한 30여 분 동안 아무도 아무런 말을 하지 않았습니다. 물론 개인적으로는 어떤 말이든 위로되는 말을 해주고 싶었지만은 그럴 기분이 모두가 아니었고 그냥 조용히 누워 있다가 그냥 다들 수고했다 그 동안 그런 말을 하고. 집으로 돌아왔습니다. 그리고 글쎄요 지금 일단 저는 군대 가기 때문에 더 이상 길드에 남아 있을 수가 없고요. 아마 길드는 남아 있지만 길드는 길러에 남아 있지만 아마 운영되지는 않을 것 같습니다. Idiot Savants moves on to the finals tomorrow afternoon. So this is the first time an American Guild has played in the finals at a World Championship. So they upset the strong Finnish team and they upset the World Championship Korean team. It's going to be an exciting match tomorrow. And so it's deja vu all over again as War Machine goes into the match as the heavy favorite. The Koreans seem to be in total control of their own destiny, but as fate would have it, they're going to face a guild on the rise. Idiot savants have stunned every opponent they've played and will most assuredly give the Koreans a run for their money. $50,000 of it, to be exact. It's War Machine against Idiot Savants in the finals. Be sure to join us back here in Leipzig, Germany at the Guild Wars Factions Championship.